चल Watching the English newscast on Future Television. I'm Linda Tamim, and these are today's top stories. State commissioner to the military court judge su su submits an appeal in the verdict against former minister Michel Smeha, while Justice Minister Ashraf Rifi reveals he will send the case to the special tribunal for Lebanon. A free patriotic movement delegation holds talks with Christian officials to promote the party's new initiative to end the presidential vacuum. An Arab coalition nations resume airstrikes against Houthi fighters in Yemen as the UN envoy to Yemen calls for an extension of the humanitarian ceasefire. State Commissioner to the Military Court Judge Sa'ad Sa has submitted an appeal in the verdict against former Mich Minister Michel Smeha. The appeal demands his retrial and that the verdict be annulled. The retrial would refer to videos of the former minister in which he discusses the transportation of explosives from Syria to use them in attacks in Lebanon. The videos also show him discussing the assassination of various Lebanese officials. Last week, the military court sentenced Smeha to four and a half years in jail over terrorism charges, including the time he served since August of 2012. The verdict created uproar among politicians and civil society, mainly the future movement, who slammed the military tribunal for its light verdict. Smeha was found guilty of having tried to carry out terrorist actions and for belonging to an armed group and was also stripped of his civil and political rights. For his part, for his part Justice Minister Ashraf Rifi has revealed he was working on transferring the terrorism case of former Information Minister Michel Smeha to the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. Rifi said there was a tendency to transfer part of the file linked to the explosives which Smeha had transferred to Lebanon to the SDL in The Hague. He added that the other part linked to Syrian President Bashar al-Assad's alleged involvement in the case could be transferred to the International Criminal Court. A free patriotic movement delegation has held talks with Christian top officials meeting Maronite Patriarch Bashar al and Lebanese forces leader Samir Jaja to promote the party's new initiative to end the presidential vacuum. Aoun's proposal announced at a news conference on Friday provided four options to solve the presidential crisis. The delegation, including MPs Ibrahim Kanaan, Namatallah Abi Nasir, Alain Aoun, and Salim Salhab, handed a copy of the proposal to Rai. Speaking at a news conference after the meeting, Kanaan said Rai welcomed the initiative. Responding to criticism that the initiative received from political rivals, most of whom focused on the need to alter the Constitution, he said respecting the will of Christians was not a violation of the Constitution, but rather it backed it. For his part, Jaja said the Lebanese forces were open to all suggestions. The delegation has also, set, has also met with Kitaib leader Amin Jmail and will meet with future movement officials on Wednesday and later with Progressive Socialist Party leader MP Walid Jumblat. On Saturday, Hezbollah leader Said Hassan Nasrallah urged the rival factions to seriously consider Aoun's proposal to end the presidential stalemate. The advisor of Iran's supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, Ali Akbar Velayati, has expressed confidence in the, in the politician's ability to find the appropriate solution to Lebanon's presidential vacuum and lauded them on the unity to confront extremism. The visiting official told reporters upon landing in Beirut that it was up to the Lebanese to solve the country's political problems. Following talks with Speaker Nabih Bedi and Ayn Atine, Velayati said he was proud of the victories achieved by Hezbollah along with the Syrian army in confronting the armed Takfiri groups in Syria's Kalamun region. Velayati is in Beirut on a one-day official visit for talks with top officials, including Prime Minister Tamam Slam, who said Lebanon was bound to fight terrorists. He expressed confidence in the ability of rival parties to find the appropriate solution to the presidential crisis. Five civilians, including two children, were killed when the Islamic State jihadist group fired a barrage of rockets on residential neighborhoods in Syria's ancient city of Palmyra. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights also reported fierce clashes between the jihadists and government troops on the outskirts of the city's 2,000-year-old UNESCO World Heritage Site. Syrian antiquities officials say two rockets fell on the garden of Palmyra's museum on Sunday, which houses statues, sarcophagi, and other well-preserved artifacts, luckily without causing any damage. 
ISIS has surrounded the city after launching a fierce assault on May the 13th, briefly overrunning parts of the north and east. Since Saturday, the jihadists have been firmly entrenched less than a mile away from Palmyra's archaeological treasures, including colonnaded alleys and elaborate tombs. And coming up next, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry says North Korea has not even come close to initiating peace talks. That and more after the break. Welcome back. Arab coalition nations have resumed airstrikes against Houthi fighters in Yemen. As UN envoy to Yemen, Ismail Ul Sheikh Ahmed called for an extension of a five day humanitarian ceasefire that expired late last night. The coalition reportedly targeted Houthi rebel positions in Al Sawlaban and Al Arish in Aden province. Al Masira Television, a Houthi backed channel, reported that Saudi troops were also shelling Al Manzala district in Al Dalih near the Yemen Saudi border, in addition to Al Ghaur Mountain. Speaking in the South Korean capital, Seoul, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry said the U.S. continues to support the idea of a humanitarian ceasefire in Yemen, but that such a truce was difficult given the current circumstances. For his part, Iran's Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif said he was gravely concerned about the truce in Yemen coming to an end and signs pointing to the fact it would not be renewed. But we know that uh, the Houthi were engaged in moving some missile launcher capacity to the border uh, and under the rules of engagement uh, it was always understood that if there were proactive moves by one side or the other uh, then that would be in violation of the ceasefire agreement which by the way ends uh, I think ends at the end of last night at any rate but with that move Saudi Arabia under the rules of engagement took action to take out those missile launchers. We continue to support the idea of extending a humanitarian pause, uh, but I think under the circumstances at the moment uh, that would be difficult. The UN talks. The targets in most areas have been civilian uh, areas and, and it, is, it is regrettable that that has continued. It is also regrettable that humanitarian assistance has failed to reach the people of Yemen who are in dire need of humanitarian assistance and it has become uh, an issue uh, for uh, uh, military intervention, uh, for continued military intervention in Yemen, including bombardment of runways and, and civilian airports. So we call on the United Nations, first of all, to use every possibility that it has, and for the rest of the international community, particularly the United Nations, considering its responsibility, in order to extend the ceasefire and the unfortunate uh, new rumors that ceasefire may not be extended uh, is a cause for grave concern. People of Yemen continue to suffer and it is high time for everybody, particularly the United Nations, to take the lead in establishing areas that are open uh, to uh, international humanitarian assistance. Of course, the United Nations can uh, inspect and make sure that uh, the aid that is being delivered to the people of Yemen is humanitarian. It is also necessary to provide medical assistance to the sick and wounded in Yemen, and, and that is one element of this humanitarian issue which has been totally neglected. So all in all, we need a very serious, concerted international effort to deal with Yemen uh, and to deal with this humanitarian crisis. And of course, the political solution is the only solution, and that is why we believe that uh, Yemen, intra-Yemeni dialogue should take place as soon as possible under UN auspices. Moving on to Iraq, the Islamic State group has killed at least 500 people, both civilians and soldiers, and forced 8,000 to flee their homes as it captured the city of Ramadi. The militants seized control of Ramadi, sending Iraqi forces fleeing in a major loss despite the support of U.S.-led airstrikes targeting the extremists. The armed group had earlier made significant gains in its battle to control Ramadi, besieging the army base and killing 15 soldiers in multiple suicide car bomb attacks. Consequ consequently, Iraq's government has reportedly asked Shia-led militias to prepare to deploy and fight in the Anbar province. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry says North Korea has not even come close to initiating talks by taking the steps needed to rein in its nuclear weapons program. Speaking in the South Korean capital, Seoul Kerry blamed North Korea for continuing to break promises, make threats, and show flagrant disregard for international law 
by continuing provocative nuclear and missile activity while oppressing its own people. The U.S. Secretary of State said Washington continued to offer the isolated North the chance for an improved relationship in return for signs of a genuine willingness to end its nuclear program. With respect to uh, the methodology for the boosting of sanctions and other things, we're discussing all of that now. Uh, China obviously has extraordinary leverage. The sanctions against North Korean officials earlier this year are one example of the use of such a tool in response to DPRK's provocative, destabilizing, and repressive actions, including the cyber attack on Sony Pictures. Now, as the international community moves towards consensus about what exactly constitutes unacceptable behavior in cyberspace, more and more responsible nations need to join together to act against disruptors and rogue actors. Worldwide, the risk and frequency of such attacks is on the increase. America's policy is to promote international cyber stability. The goal is to create a climate in which all states are able to enjoy the benefits of cyberspace, all have incentives to cooperate and avoid conflict, and all have good reason not to disrupt or attack one another. To achieve this, we are seeking a broad consensus on where to draw the line between responsible and irresponsible behavior. As I've mentioned, the basic rules of international law apply in cyberspace. Hollywood actor Robert De Niro may be known as a Hollywood star, but the actor has a head for business as well. De Niro and Japanese chef Nobu Matsuisa opened a luxury hotel, part of the 1.3 billion U.S. dollar city of Dreams Casino Resort Complex in Manila's entertainment city. The Oscar-winning actor said he was not only lending his name to the project, but was personally involved in it. De Niro said the hotel was part of a vision sold to him and his partners by Ho and Packer. He said it's going to draw people and eventually help the Philippines. Nobu Hospitality plans to open eight other Nobu City hotels in the next two years. This marks the end of our bulletin for today. Now for a reminder of our top stories. State Commissioner to the Military Court, Judge Sa Sa submits an appeal in the verdict against former Minister Michel Smeha, while Justice Minister Ashraf Rifi reveals he will send the case to the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. A free patriotic movement delegation holds talks with Christian officials to promote the party's new initiative to end the presidential vacuum. And Arab coalition nations resume airstrikes against Houthi fighters in Yemen as the UN envoy to Yemen calls for an extension of the humanitarian ceasefire. Those are your top stories for today. I'm Linda Tamim and I wish you all a very nice evening. كان الحظير هنا لي عملية ربية